comme je viens de le dire à Noir, je suis le colonel Christian Moya, chef d'unité de la formation au Centre africain d'études et de recherche sur le terrorisme. J'ai le signe honneur ce matin ou cet après-midi chez moi ici à Alger d'être le modérateur de cette session qui est dédiée aux efforts communautaires pour la prévention et la réintégration des ex-combattants dans le contexte de la prévention et la lutte contre l'extrémisme violent. Euh, lors de la session 4 qui s'est déroulée le mardi dernier, euh, vous avez eu à traiter euh, des questions liées aux approches de la police communautaire. We have questions that we're dealing with uh, concerning uh, police, community policing and the interventions of these. During this session, we will discuss all of these issues to be able to assure the inclusion of young people in these efforts to counter terrorism. We will uh, today deal with another issue. We want to see what are the efforts that will be put into place uh, in, to assure the rehabilitation and the reintegration of um, ex-fighters former fighters in the community. Many African countries are faced with this difficult situation. The phenomena of former fighters returning to the community. And so we are dealing with women, with men, with children who are leaving their, um, F, their association with extreme violence and trying to reintegrate within their own community. And often these countries receiving these former fighters have very fragile justice systems. And it's very difficult to deal with this problem. So, and the, the there is also, of course, problems of cohabitation between these actors of violent extremism and the members of the community. And therefore, it will be necessary for states of dealing with this, it will be necessary that they put into place strategies that will be able to um, deal with these challenges. And they need to find ways to reinforce these strategies so that we are able to closely examine and study these issues. Today I have with me two speakers. We have the Dr. Amelie Anneli Botta and Mr. Peter Olowa. Excuse me if I've mispronounced his name. I'm going to introduce them briefly so that you can know who is speaking to you. So Dr. Anneli Botta is a senior lecturer at the University of Free State in South Africa. I did not want to translate the name of the university, but it's Free State, University of Free State in South Africa. She is also a researcher, scholar, and consultant studying terrorism and violent extremism between 2003 and 2016. She was employed as a senior researcher on terrorism at the Institute for Security Studies in Pretoria. After completing an honors degree in international politics, she joined the South African Police Service, Crime Intelligence in 1993, during which she focused on terrorism and religious extremism. She also holds a MA in Political Studies degree at the Rand Africans University obtained in 1999 that focused on the historical development of terrorism, religious extremism, and pagad. 
She completed her PhD at the University of the Free State, studying radicalization and terrorism. She wrote her dissertation on the topic of radicalization to commit terrorism from a political socialization perspective in Kenya and Uganda. She has a specific interest in research on the underlying causes of terrorism, radicalization, and counterterrorism strategies. The second speaker is Mr. Peter Oloa, who is a founding member of the Serendi Rehabilitation Support Team. He is of, also serves as its deputy team leader. He has a wide experience in stabilization and post-war recovery, including through supporting the Amnesty Act in Uganda, capacity building for the South Sudan DDR Commission, and contributing to UNESCO initiatives within the greater Eastern Africa region. Therefore, so that we can enter our subject, I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Anneli Botta. Good morning. How can you present to us this, these issues of intervention to rehabilitate these um, former fighters. Uh, good day, Christian, Mr. Chairperson, and, and thank you again for the opportunity to the African Center for Strategic Studies, but also Kayat. It's a wonderful privilege to, to be with you. Um, to answer your question in short, because I think it's good, we want to have an engagement and discussion about this, so I'm not gonna hopefully talk too long, is that one I have to understand or differentiate be between two fundamental principles. I think the first one is how do we deal with a conflict situation? Do we see it as a military intervention? So in dealing with insurgencies, as you find in Somalia and Nigeria to a large degree, um, in Syria, where you had a, a typical, typical insurgency where people were radicalized and recruited from abroad and now returning to the countries of origin. And the question is how to rehabilitate and reintegrate them back into the community per se. On the other hand, one also have situations where the threat emerged from domestic circumstances, where um, it is a purely terrorist organization, um, very different from a typical uh, DDR process that we would normally follow for example, in the case of um, Somalia, or in some cases earlier in a conflict in, um, in Nigeria, and even beyond that. So the question is, who is how do we consider um, the conflict initially? And that will have an immediate impact on how do we see the intervention, rehabilitation, and reintegration. So in terms of a, a particular um, insurgency movement in which we now have to follow almost a DDR process, disarmament and, 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 and rehabilitation, reintegration into this whole process. It follows a very different flow than in the case of where you see it's a criminal justice framework where a person has been arrested, went through the criminal justice system, where a person has been convicted, um, incarcerated, and now serving his sentence or her sentence and now being released. So in the case of, of the former, in most cases, we often differentiate between high risk and low risk. And I think in most cases, uh, people, especially in Somalia, as what I've, that I've seen quite a bit, is that if a person um, defected or surrendered, that the person is considered to be a low risk and if a person has been captured um, or, or arrested, depending on the situation, that that immediately interprets a person is considered to be a higher risk. And that will influence the way the path that the person can take. Being arrested would mean that there will be a, a, a military tribunal uh, in most cases, for example, in the case of Somalia, where a person will be convicted and go through the criminal justice system. 
Um, in the case of, of a rehabilitation center, so um, disengagement considered to be willingly, whether the person surrendered or defected, um, the rehabilitation process um, starts through a rehabilitation center where a person basically completes a period um, in which there is constant engagement um, in dealing with the potential underlying reasons why the person actually joined the organization. So these interventions are basically focused predominantly on how do we encourage this engagement? Uh, for example, how do you, so if you have an amnesty program, you could offer the, the potential for disengagement is, is higher than when there is no potential for, um, for amnesty or the question of rehabilitation and reintegration through the DDR process. So that, that in itself, I think the first principle comes in, how would a person be treated after um, defected or surrendering versus the case of being arrested and convicted. Um, it also allows opportunity for that few months being, in, um, being rehabilitated and reintegrated to offer a number of programs. And we saw that in the case of Somalia, where I've a better understanding and, and being more engaged with, um, with very formal structure in the sense of people um, is, is basically uh, in a facility where there's an actual process occurring. Um, in cases where the people returned from conflict areas, for example, in Europe, and I think to a large degree in Kenya as well, there's a bit of more uncertainty in terms of how do you deal with the situation at hand. So I'm going to start that, there with the, with, the, with the approaches and, and how it's being, in, the, the intervention occurs. So I hope that people understand that differentiation. So we also need to make a differentiation in terms of our overall assessment and also how we discuss the topic of rehabilitation and reintegration afterwards. Is it going to be in a format of a conflict area, where it's an insurgency movement on one side, or whether we see it as, as a person being arrested, convicted, um, in prison, rehabilitated, reintegration. There is an overlap between them. I don't think one should see it as completely separate, but I think there is definitely an understanding on terms of how do we, assess, why do we, how do we assess success um, on the medium and long term as well. So back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anneli, for these, um, this differentiation of these different forms of intervention. I will ask you later to to speak more on these uh, principles, but I am now going to uh, turn now to, to we are going to speak of the different programs of rehabilitation and reintegration. I would like to know how can you define the comparative advantages that exist between the government actors and the non-state actors vis-a-vis -vis these programs. Is the question to me or is the question to you? The question is for Peter Olawa. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Emmanuel, and uh, good afternoon uh, to all the participants. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you know, African you know, Center for Strategic Studies you know, for being part of you know, this discussion uh, uh, to, to today. Uh, well, reintegration, rehabilitation and uh, reintegration has uh, tremendously evolved and I think in the last you no know, couple of years, say 15 you know, to 20 years, I think you know, from the onset of September 
11th law, we have seen uh, a, a shift, you know, from um, conflict, you know, conventional conflict, you know, to now what we are looking at as, I mean, radicalization, terrorism, and I think, you know, it's like the involvement of this has uh, in itself created, you know, the need to adjust those like rehabilitation programs and reintegration programs, you know, uh, suitable to the needs or the context. And uh, previously, you know, in the formal DDR, where, you know, we would have comprehensive peace agreements, say like in the case for South Sudan, or say under the multi-country demobilization program, which was run you know, in seven African countries, Uganda, Angola, Burundi, uh, to, 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 uh, among others, you know, it was not like, you no know, very formal, you know, like DDR, you know, where we would see uh, ex-combatants, you know, lay down their arms and uh, it would be very uh, convenient you not know, to implement, you know, like a DDR program. But uh, today, uh, rehabilitation and uh, reintegration, you know, in itself, you no know, poses, you know, a great challenge because of the different contexts that you know, we are dealing with, you know, from uh, dealing with terrorist you know, groups, you know, like Al Shabaab in uh, Somalia that have their operations you no know, move along the region, Uganda, you know, Kenya, Boko Haram, you know, in Nigeria, and uh, so, so this you know, in itself, you no, know, has um, made rehabilitation and uh, reintegration multifaceted you know from one context you no know, to 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 another um but uh looking at those you know, like you know the comparative but it is easy to look at the comparative ad advantage but i would rather you know say like, look at the complementarity of government and then non-state actors you no know, say like, because there is a role that governments have to play and there's a role that the non government actors you know need to play and these are complementary. So there is, uh, there is uh, no comparative advantage, you know, I really see, but I see more of the complementarity between, you know, say state and non-state, you know, actors. Government, you know, always has a role to provide the legal framework within which rehabilitation and uh, reintegration should take place and like Dr. Anneli you knows, like you know, mentioned, you know, like really depending on uh, the context, you knows like you know, like how how do you look at we have uh, cross border infiltration of terrorist groups? How do you deal with cross border? In in formal DDR, you know, it was much more uh, easier. So government you now has uh, the the duty, you know, to provide the legal framework. We have seen like the case for Uganda. There was uh, a, a, an Amnesty Act, you know, which was. Uh, the basis you know, for the implementation of the DDR there to provide amnesty for mainly the, the LRA fighters and other fighters. We have seen, you know, like the case, you know, in, a, in a South Sudan, there was a comprehensive, you know, peace uh, agreement and uh, which, you know, led to the right sizing, downsizing of uh, SPLA. We have seen lately, you know, uh, in, in, in places like you no know, Somalia, which is struggling you know, with both rehabilitation of high risk uh, uh, fighters you know, in prison facilities or detention you know, facilities versus you know, low risk you know, in, uh, in uh, rehabilitation centers. So that, 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 that's one. Uh, the other hand, the government also uh, provides you know, the, safe, the safeguard you know, the me me mechanism you know, for, for, for the fighters because Government has a responsibility of providing, ensuring the physical security of ex-combatants. And this is you now one of um, the key areas that you NOSEC know, are very you know, important because ex-combatants, people defect, people put down, lay their arms when they're, on, when they're sure that they will be safe, you know, both in communities and then in the hands of uh, government. So government has a duty and, uh, and this NOSEC has to be done in NOSEC, you know, consistent with the uh, international human rights law and the international obligations of uh, the particular uh, country. The uh, ensuring the economic security of uh, the, the, the ex, I mean, ex-combatants, you know, through a number of activities, vocational training, 
And uh, also, you know, it's like government has a duty, you know, to ensure the political influence of our uh, ex-combatants and include, in, including participation, you know, in the political space, you know, is very important because many times you find that most of these fighters are engaging, you no know, governments you know, for political or social economic you know, reasons. And I think when they choose to get out, you know, say the causes of uh, these, uh, the reasons why they joined, you know, must not be addressed. And I think I completely agree with Dr. Anemi that, you know, say, you know, the, the programs that we should be looking at, you know, today, that address no deradicalization should be tailored not only to the context of the country or the area of operations, but also to the needs of the individuals that are coming out of these uh, of these uh, uh, terrorist you know, organizations. So I see that you know, like as on the side of the government, you know, like where government really has a role, which can be also seen as a comparative advantage. And for the non-state actors, the, the civil society organizations, you know, the, the communities, the communities do have it, and civil society do have a huge role because these are the communities where in the first place uh, the ex the fighters now come from so the communities produce the fighters and uh, communities have been known not to to support you no know, like some I mean this uh, insurgency you no know, like in, in all an insurgency insurgency cannot survive you no know, without you no know, like the support of uh, the, the community so they, they reassure and this is the community where the after rehabilitation or going through the criminal justice system, this is where re, uh, ex, ex combatants know re -inter, in, integrate. Now, yeah, the, the, the non government actors know like usually have better links know with the communities, local knowledge, and uh, uh, co context know that know uh, provides know the avenues for the ex fighters or the defectors, you know, to promote reconciliation for the reassurance that um, people, you know, say returning from uh, uh, insurgencies, you know, will be uh, successfully, you know, accepted, you know, in uh, communities. So for social reintegration, the non-state actors play a very crucial role. Um, uh, also, uh, the, the, the non-state actors, the NGOs, you know, say, you know, provide, you no, know, they're best suited, you no, know, to, to provide, you no, know, like the counter narrative, you know, say, like now we are dealing mainly with uh, radicalization, you know, to provide the counter narrative, you know, to, to say, like, you no know, uh, groups like, you no know, Al Shabaab, you know, so, and, uh, and of course, they have the sufficient uh, capacity and uh, agility, you know, to turn around, you know, things, you know, which usually it would be very difficult, you know, for, for government. So briefly, that is what I would like, you know, to say for, for the beginning. Thank you. Uh, merci, merci. Thank you so much, Peter. We can, uh, from what you were saying, uh, the role that is played by the state actors and non-state actors are very important and they're complementary. And it varies depending on the context of each program. I will come back now to to Anneli and ask her, in this case, can, what can you foresee, what can you suggest to us in terms of strategies that, that for which rehabilitation and reintegration can be efficiently undertaken and how in particular in what ways can the approaches of community policing um, improve and support these efforts? Thank you very much for that question. It, it's a good question and, 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 and quite complex at the same time. Um, I'm going to list them. Um, as to what I think is, is critical for, for this to be effective in the long term. I think first and foremost, we have to, and I heard it from Peter, 
that we mentioned, is we have to understand the underlying reasons why people joined these organizations. We often deal with regularization from a perspective of the organization and what the organization is standing for. But there's a very, there's a very, very severe difference between why an individual join and why the organization exists. So we definitely have to, again, tailor our approach to what is the circumstances that led to the person being radicalized in the first place. So with a, we deal with foreign terrorist fighters that traveled abroad to a conflict area in Syria or Somalia, um, or whether it's a question of a cross-border or whether it's a question of uh, uh, a Somali national in Somalia deciding to join an organization like Al-Shabaab. All of these issues starts with local circumstances. Um, we, we need to address the underlying reasons why people join. And that is complex, and that requires a holistic approach. Um, secondly, what I will link to that, um, and, I, and again, I think I'm not going to go back to this question of, of, of the DDR process versus the criminal justice approach, because if you deal with community policing, you now move into, into the approach of a criminal justice approach, not so much a DDR approach. Uh, but in any case, let's, let's keep that. The principles may be the same, but there's a few differences between them. Um, the second point I think is critical is the question of security. Security for the community first and foremost, but also security towards the person being radicalized and reintegrated, or that's being radicalized, that is rehabilitated and reintegrated. And this comes back to the question of the environment, as Peter mentioned. The environment is critical. And I think one could learn quite a few lessons from um, the way normal criminals, um, for example, a, a person that's being involved in, in uh, using narcotics or smuggling narcotics uh, or being part of a gang and being arrested and convicted and now have to rehabilitate rehabilitated and reintegrated back into society. The question of to what do you release the person to? Is it, a, is it the environment that's going to stimulate um, recidivism? Um, and, and Peter mentioned that if, if the community is supporting um, the organization or the insurgency or the movement in the first place, by returning the person back to that community, um, and being rehabilitated, you put that person's life at risk. Um, and so that is the first point of departure. We noted, and it's not, uh, it's, we all know this, that as soon as a person has been re rehabilitated, reintegrated into a community where people feel so strongly towards the ideology of the organization, that person will be killed. So you also have to keep in mind that person's well-being in mind. Um, so that is that is a question of 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 security. Um, it also, for me, comes back to the question of, um, and that links to the pre the previous point, the community. Now, the community in which the person has been radicalized from, that do not support the ideology of the organization, and that happens. I don't think we need to make an assumption that everyone supports, for example, Al-Shabaab um, that has been radicalized um, to join Al-Shabaab. Uh, they will be, in most cases, the majority of the community saying, no, we don't agree with the ideology. We may um, have sympathy for the reasons why the individual joined, but the question always remains a question of trust. If the person is being re rehabilitated and reintegrated, there always will be this question of, can we trust this person? And if there is no trust being established, the possibility of the person going back to the organization definitely exists for two reasons. The first one is the question of belonging. To what, ex what extent a person feel that he or she belongs 
to the community. Or will a person be considered to be an outsider, an outcast, and deemed with a lot of suspicion? And if suspicion exists, the attraction from the organization that provided a sense of belonging may also occur. A similar point, and I think that this is possibly one of the biggest concerns when you come down to security, is a possibility that the person might have defected, rehabilitated, reintegrated, trusted by the security forces, just to use that trust to actually commit an act of terrorism against those that is now um, allowing him in. And we noticed that in the attack in Somalia on the 7th of, of November, where a person that repented, um, rehabilitated, um, and actually turned. Um, so that also raises the question of trust. This trust has to be mutual on both sides. And you're only going to build that trust through a period of engagement and a period of building that relationship of the person back into the community. So that is a, a third point. You've raised the question of community policing. Now community policing is again raising the issue of why the person joined in the first place. And the unfortunate reality is in research being conducted by myself and being part of, of broader studies in interviewing people joining Al-Shabaab um, but also other organizations are, is that the way the government responded in dealing with terrorism, in dealing with radicalization, actually contributed to radicalization. So the question of abuse of power, the question of uh, being treated as a second-rate citizen in some cases, and you notice that especially in, in um, having interviews with people in Kenya and the coastal region, um, especially from Somali origin, being regarded as um, being um, guilty by association of belonging to a particular ethnic group, not having the same level of services that, that others. And this comes down to, to a sense of marginalization or the privation, rid of the privation, it may not even exist. But the, the question may be that people feel as if they are not given the same circumstances or the same advantages as the broader community. And if these circumstances still exist, by going through this entire process of rehabilitation and reintegration, I can assure you that that immediate impact as to why the person has joined in the first place will still exist. So this requires that we not only take about take look at, at the person that's being radicalized, but we also address the reasons why uh, we allowed radicalization to occur in the first place. And that requires a bit of introspection um, from all parties concerned. Um, and that is often very difficult, especially in, when you refer to community policing. Community policing is a wonderful principle. With community policing means that you establish a relationship of trust between a community and the public in, the, in which the community feel that those protecting them has their best interest at heart and act in the interest of the entire community. Now, you can have a program in place, but the question is to what extent do each and every police officer, for example, in that region, um, not only sh say this, by, but also show this. So for example, if you have a situation, and I noticed, especially in the research we conducted again in Kenya, because that is the area we did a lot of research in, is that police officers seldom represent the community and representing in terms of religion as well as ethnic background. So if, a, if there's a sense of, but the police is not representing the community, the question will immediately exist to what extent can we trust the police officers? The second point in terms of, if you look at the interaction at a police station, you can have a program in, in, on paper, 
But ask yourself if a person should go to a police station reporting a crime or reporting a problem, will that person be treated as a suspect or as a victim? And if the person is treated as a suspect, that will, without being radicalized, I'm not, I'm not even mentioning radicalization, uh, will again break that level of trust where the, where the community see the police as serving their best interest. Um, so all of these factors play a role. So I will, would encourage us to move beyond community policing as a principle, but rather look at community policing as it is being applied in practice in vulnerable communities, not in areas where it's, people are not vulnerable. I'm referring to vulnerable communities. So, and we can see this playing out in the northern part of Mozambique or whether it's coastal region of, of Kenya um, or whether it's a case of, of, of um, Boko Haram uh, in Nigeria and beyond. For me, it comes down to what is that relationship in the first place between state actors and government as a whole and the community on the ground. Having a policy is very different than from implementing the policy. And if we can have the policy being implemented the way it's supposed to be implemented, we will then find a solution. But till then, um, till we have a situation where people feel that they are not receiving the same benefits as others. And this is very different from the case of Somalia. I think the primary reason why people joined our Al-Shabaab in the first place was economical regions, reasons. Um, economical reasons play a role. Then it's a question of nationalism. We're being invaded by a foreign force. This is very different than understanding regularization in Kenya or Mozambique or even beyond. So if we address this deregularization de process and the reintegration process as a one size fits all, we're not gonna be successful. We have to understand that this comes to my, to my first point I've made. It comes down to understanding the reasons why people joined in the first place. Address those reasons. And it requires, as I said earlier, dealing with a person that's being radicalized, but also doing a lot of introspection as to what, what circumstances existed that facilitated radicalization. And dealing with those circumstances is what's gonna make this a success, not only in short term, but medium to long term. Uh, merci, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anelli. I, I thank you very much and uh, I keep from your comments that there are that there are some strategic reasons and there are uh, there are reasons that depend uh, there are issues linked or pertaining to the members of community and the reasons why they join uh, uh, violent extremism and ter terrorist organizations we have to understand why these organizations exist and if we do understand why these organizations exist why these people join then we can move forward and uh, i also heard that it's very important to to look at environment at circumstances local uh, circumstances where these programs and these acts were perpetrated and why all of this happens now i would like to give the floor to peter and uh, ask him kindly about the roles that uh, the security actors can play in order to facilitate a reinsertion of uh, ex-fighters or ex-competents. You have followed the, the intervention of Dr. Anelli uh, where she stressed the importance of actors of security uh, the, the role of a security actor. So based on your experience, uh, Mr. Peter, we would be grateful if you could tell us uh, how those reinsertion of programs of ex-fighters could be successful and, and, uh, and good. Thank you. 
Yeah, uh, thank you very much, and uh, Emmanuel, and also thank you very much, no, Dr. Nelly, you know, for bringing out, you know, I mean, uh, conflicts, you no, know, must be addressed from the root causes. I think uh, the effects of conflict is always what is very visible. And many times, you no know, interventions address the effects of conflict and not the root causes of uh, of the conflict. And I think you know, your message, you know, is very clear. And uh, and I think you know, in uh, in areas where you know, it's like I we have done, you know, it's like you no know, programs, you no know, say in northern Uganda or Uganda in particular, maybe in Somalia. It, it is uh, very important that you knows like you, you you look at the the root causes because people join you know like these uh, insurgent groups you know people fight governments you know, for different reasons which could be political could be personal it could be social you know it could be any in you know, like you no know, any any reason and if you say if we use one approach you know to address all this you no know, like this is where you know it's like uh, the success you know really really varies and you know we see people who join other groups you no know, so. I think that point you know, is really very, I mean, very you know, you know, well noted. And I think that is how you know, it's like, you know, we should be looking at what are the root causes of these conflicts you know, we are looking at. And uh, the context you know, in which you know, we are seeing these conflicts you know, today are also like, uh, they are rapidly changing because uh, terrorist groups you know, like, you know, they, 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 some of you those know, are actually changing from terrorist groups you know, to political organizations. You know? So it, it's like, <laughs> It, it, it's, it's quite it's quite you no know, complicated the context though know, is very dynamic it, the some contexts are really very fluid and i think uh, <clears throat> that so that brings me back you know, to the, the the security actors you not know, like from the military who are really fighting the insurgent groups the police you know, forces and, uh, and, and 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 many others you not know, like you know they have a very key role you not know, to play and i think it is the whole entire cycle you not know, from prevention defection rehabilitation and back you not know, to reintegration the security actors you not know, like have to play a role in that entire you know cycle and where there's they where there's a lapse you no know, usually because usually the lapse you no know, begins you no know, from at prevention level if we're not doing a lot like say community policing that's when we see people sleep and then you know say get into you know this uh, uh, organization. So the, the 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 security actors, you know, like you know, have a key role in uh, sensitizing the community, the, the masses. But that also should be coupled, you know, with the alternatives, you no, know, like you know, because most of the people 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 voluntarily join insurgent groups or terrorist organizations. But there are also those who are forced through. Uh, the abductions, like you know, like the, the case you know, we saw in uh, northern Uganda, the LRA was using you know, like the method, recruit, I mean, abduction as a way of uh, uh, re recruitment. In other countries, you know, like, you know, we see, like, you know, in Kenya, you know, like most of the terrorists in Kenya are joining, you know, like, you know voluntarily, you know, like, you know, same as, you know, like, you know, in Somalia, but there are areas also where, you know, it's like you find that people, because the security forces do not provide security, so it creates room for terrorist organizations you not know, to take people from communities. And uh, so, if you go to different contexts, people join sometimes groups like Al Shabaab to provide for themselves security against Al Shabaab because there's a lapse, you no, know, like, you know, security forces in providing you no know, security of the people. So, in, in as far as you no know, prevention you know, is concerned, I think the, the security have a key role you know, to play in providing you know, for the security you know, for, 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 for everyone. But then usually you know, it's like, uh, the issue of trust you know, comes you know, in you know, because the decision to defect you know, is, is a very big you know, decision, especially from terrorists, I mean, groups you know, like you know, Al-Shabaab, you know, it's, like, you know, it's, like, it's like a one-way thing, you, know, it's like you get out, you can go back. So it, 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 uh, it, it, the, these young men and women are always you know, confronted with very difficult, but when they make those decisions, I think the first thing is that they need the re reassurance that the security forces will provide you no know, security for them when they choose you no know, to leave the terrorist organizations and that is very key security should be provided you no know, for these people so including avenues because there are people who defect during military confrontations with security forces because there are people who may want to defect but don't have the opportunity they only get the opportunity during the military 
uh, engagement. But then you know, it's like only that happens just like when they, they, they have that reassurance on how they will be treated, you know, it's like you no know, by uh, the, the the military. The army some forces, you know, in Somalia have an SOP on the handling and treatment of uh, the 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 people, you know, they capture, you know, from uh, the military engagements, you know, with Al Shabaab and handed over, you know, to the federal government, you know, of Somalia. So that treatment, you know, it's like you no know, is consistent, you know, with international human rights and human humanitarian no no law. So the, the treat if people are treated well, then it you looks know, like defections you no know, will be encouraged. If people are not treated well, then it sends a very strong message and a very bad message you no know, back you no know, to 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 the to, to the group. And you know this is where because the security forces you know, like have uh, have to balance this is as a principle they have to balance the security agenda and the human rights agenda. Because uh, in the fight you know, encountering you no know, violent and extremism, you know, sake. And I think that the, the, the debate has been always, you no know, sake, on whether how do governments balance the security agenda, agenda versus, you know, the human rights, you know, sake, you no know, call. And I think this is where security actors you know who mainly interface, because they're mainly the first points of, uh, in most most cases, they are the first points of contact, you no, know, sake, in infections. So usually it's family members, and then family members take defectors, you not know, to say security agencies that are handling, you know, it's like uh, the, the defection. So that has to be, you know, also um, clearly, you know, it has to clearly come out that, you know, it's like the balance between security and human rights, you no, know, should be done. Uh, then uh, security agencies, the military, you know, it's like secure pathways for negotiations, they secure pathways for mediation, they secure pathways, you no, know, for for defections and um, like I previously mentioned, you know that if uh, an insurgent you know, knows how they will be handled if they defected or surrendered to the military you know, forces they have been fighting, if the treatment you know, is well and they're aware of it, then they, it is re reassuring and this is what encourages defections you know, in, uh, from the insurgent groups or the terrorists you know, or, or organization. In the, in the rehabilitation process, I have seen in the rehabilitation no centers, you no know, say, you know, in Mogadishu, the rehabilitation centers, you no, know, we had, uh, say, Northern New Uganda, in, you know, it's like, yes, the security, again, people who leave the terrorist groups, it's like, want to feel secure in rehabilitation centers. Because these rehabilitation centers come, you no know, through uh, several threats you know, by, by the, the insurgent you know, group. So pro securing you know, like the rehabilitation center you know, is very important. And that interface you know, between security agencies, and um, I know there are people who will not agree, especially when it comes to the rehabilitation of ch the reintegration of children. Yes, but for adults, you know, like, I think the interface you know, between uh, security agencies and uh, uh, the insurgents who have left you know, the groups, you no, know, in itself, you no, know, like, you know, becomes so very reassuring, you know, for, for 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 the for the groups. But of course, you know, it's like we've also seen, you know, it's like uh, both, you know, in the formal DDR and then in the non-traditional DDR or the radicalization programs, where security agencies absorb former fighters, you know, into the security forces, and uh, for gainful uh, employment for. And, and then for others, you know, because one of the reasons you know, why people join uh, these insurgent groups you know, is because they lack you know, like opportunities, they lack jobs. The young men you know, like, you know, who have limited access you know, to education or have education, but you know, like they have no access you know, to employment opportunities. So absorbing them is also another key role. And of course, you know, like when uh, insurgents, you know, uh, when they leave these rehabilitation you know, centers and they get into communities, the follow-up you no know, like, you know, mechanism you no know, is mainly done you know by uh, security agencies in coordination you know, with the community leaders. It is a it's, it's, it's a because the community where uh, people who benefit from these programs get into the communities need the re reassurance that they will be safe. But then also you know, it's like somebody who has defected you no know, from a group and gone undergone rehabilitation also needs that reassurance 
that you know, they will also be saved. So it is, and it is a collective you know, responsibility of uh, a person who has undergone rehabilitation, the community and the security agencies. Usually the security agencies are put you know, so like, you know, in the middle that if I get to that community, I'll be saved. And the community is like, yes, you bring this person in the community, we shall, <laughs> we shall be saved. So I think this, like, there's, there's a monitoring role that the security need you know, to play. And I think you know, sometimes you know, this is lacking until something really terribly happens. Like, you know, where we have cases of uh, people getting knocked back, uh, you know, into these groups, or where you have um, cases, you know, where reconciliation has not been uh, uh, done, you know, so like, you no know, properly. Because, you no know, terrorists and uh, insurgents, you know, do a lot of things, you not know, like, under these groups. And uh, co communities, you know, like, that are victims, you know, like, need accountability. So that, you know, it's like, you know, in itself, if that accountability, you know, is not done, you know, it's like, then, of course, it's like, you know, there's a risk, you know, of uh, people not being, you know, both communities not being safe, you know, with uh, beneficiaries, you know, from uh, the radicalization programs, and then beneficiaries, because we saw in the case of uh, uh, Northern Uganda, you know, it's like, you know, after some years, you know, it's like, we noticed, you know, it's like a case, many cases of suicide you know, because people could not just cope you know, with the uh, co co communities and i think that is something that no sake is also very important so healing healing the wounds of uh war supporting uh societal reconciliation individual trauma healing is uh it's something that you know is done no sake no mainly at community level and uh, just like i've mentioned the, the security the, the security agencies play the middleman role here between communities and then insurgents you know, returning you know, or being reintegrated reintegrated you know into communities after after uh, rehabilitation rehabilitation the, the final thing I wanted to mention you know, is that the civil military civil military relationships are very very you know important and um, we have seen um, cases, you know, where the relationship between the military agencies or security forces is not really very good, you know, with community members and that becomes you no know, detrimental, you know, to people who are returning, you know, say, you know, into communities after rehabilitation and uh, for, 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 for reintegration. The, the, the other thing I wanted to mention that, you know, say, rehabilitation and reintegration, you know, say, it's a process. And it's sometimes it's very difficult you not know, to have a clear cut demarcation on whether rehabilitation stops when somebody leaves the rehabilitation center or reintegration or, or, or re reintegration begins when somebody gets you know, into community. And I think this is also one of the, the things that, because I think you know, like reintegration is the whole process and it starts from defecting and then going through rehabilitation. And then uh, later on, maybe you know, we shall see how reintegration you know, you know, is done you know, in some of the projects, but you know, it is uh, it's very intertwined, you know, process that, and I see that uh, there's evidence you not know, to, to back that rehabilitation continues in communities where integration is taking place, and reintegration starts you not know, from rehabilitation centers. So I think also that you know, is very important, and that is why the security actors you know, like, you know, have a key role you know, to play from prevention, defection where there are peace, you know, it's like uh, deals to rehabilitation, to reintegration. So they pre play uh, a holistic, you know, it's like, you know, role. And I think this is the disconnect, you no, know, is usually, you know, it's like in many, in many, I would not mention no, like now, but I think this is, this has always been, I think, uh, Dr. Nelly, you tried to mention, you know, it's like something, you know, in, uh, in the, the programming, you no, know, it's like, you know, in Kenya, because it, 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 the, the security agencies you know, only play the role at some point and then you just like you take let these people back you know, into community and they become a uh, problem to the community thank you very much merci beaucoup peter for uh, thank you very much peter for your enlightening uh, comments uh, thank you i would like to 
summarize uh, your comments by saying that security agencies have a, a, a critical role to play. They have to make sure uh, that they are uh, on par with the, with, the, with the respect of human rights and uh, principles and that these programs are addressed uh, in order to ensure that security is there and that uh, there is a, an awareness raising process and that the beneficiaries of the programs are uh, taken care of and that these security agencies play their roles in the rules of the RSO in the light of has been said so far. I would like to ask Dr. Anelli to uh, the following question. Could you please tell us uh, uh, what are the uh, necessary principles that have to be uh, integrated within these programs in order to ensure their efficiency? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Peter, for, that, for those comments. Um, I'm going to start off, and I, I think I've addressed quite a few of them, is, is first and foremost to tailor it, to be long-term successful, um, to understand uh, the circumstances that drove it from an individual perspective, not from an organizational perspective, is, is definitely going to be very, very important. I think it's also critical to realize that and ask yourself why a person has deflected or uh, disengaged in the first place. And I may sound a bit, um, um, how should I, uh, a skeptic in most cases, but uh, I think we as human beings are always constantly doing a cost and benefit analysis in the decisions we are making. And um, the, the question often comes in is that if, if I can see that the benefit to disengage is, is outweighing the cost of engaging, that, that people will definitely start disengaging. So we need to create an environment in which the positive uh, of disengaging is weighing more than the cost that by still being a member of the organization would entail. And with that being said, um, it starts off with an individual perspective. I completely agree, agree with Peter, it's a long-term process. We need to understand that the regularization does not happen overnight. And similarly, deregularization will equally not take um, a week or a few days. It's a long-term process. I still engage with people that were very committed members of Al Shabaab that has been released since, and we stay in contact still. And uh, they've been really radicalized and they reintegrated successfully. And um, just to hear what they have to say is constantly, it's constantly a process. But uh, by creating an environment where people feel that they have a lot to lose. So in this case, for example, um, the young man married, have a child, have different responsibilities, um, have an environment in which he belongs to. Um, all of that provided an environment where he feels um, that he has more to lose by rejoining. That's the first thing. And the second thing is he willingly de radicalized. Um, I think we also have to understand that you cannot force a person to, to de radicalize. Disengage is easy. Disengage means the person's being arrested. But disengaging from the ideology of the organization um, can take some time. And, and that is something you cannot project on a, on a projector. I don't know what's in people's minds or what is in their hearts. What they are saying is, can be very different from what they're actually feeling. Because again, the cost benefit approach means that by saying, I am, I, I've, I've seen the light, I will never do this again, is very different from how a person actually feels. Um, so that is also equally, I think, something that we have to keep in mind. Um, also, we have to deal with perceptions that they exist, and, and Peter alluded to it in terms of the community itself, how people on the community feel about these people reintegrating and also seeing the long-term objective of reintegration and rehabilitation. I mentioned that, but also dealing with the circumstances. 
uh, if you don't address the underlying reasons, it will not be the son of, it will, or the father of joining the organization, it will be the son of joining the organization. Not immediately, but 10, 20 years from now. So we have to start to invest more time and energy in addressing the underlying reasons. By taking a militaristic approach or strong hand approach, by dealing with security only, is maybe um, a short-term solution to the problem, but it's not gonna be a long-term solution. You will see this re-emerging again, as we've seen, for example, in so many other conflicts where the underlying reasons were never addressed. So that is also another lesson that we have to learn. Also, I think our radical deradicalization strategies need to look at not only the low risk, but also the high risk. Um, I think we, we tend to, to go for the low hanging fruits, for those that is already uh, not sure, or those who joined out of economic reasons, or that they see the immediate benefits by joining the organization. Um, we haven't even started to discuss how do you deal with those that's being radicalized, being arrested, being convicted, serving these sentences and now being released. And the challenge is, what if this person has never been de-radicalized? Uh, you cannot keep a person in prison forever. Um, it is unconstitutional, especially after serving a sentence. But what to the extent do we focus on those that, how do we deal with people that do not want to be de-radicalized? Um, and, and I know that some cases people might have an easy answer to the question and I immediately think about the implications to human rights. And that is often the concern that it will come down not only what we're saying, but also what we are doing. And we also have to keep in mind that what we are doing are also being interpret, interpreted by the other side of the fence. And we don't want to encourage people to join the ranks of terrorist organizations and be radicalized. So it is a very fine balancing act. And I hope that we can move beyond the short term to more to the long term. I'm gonna stop here. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anili. So briefly, I shall ask Peter, can you give us a quick overview of the situation of your Serendi team, of which you are the uh, vice, uh, the deputy team leader? And what are the successes that you have seen in your program? Very briefly, please. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Nostek. In fact, Nost, like uh, the, it's called the low level defectors, you know, uh, program, you know, uh, I'll be very brief, you Nostek, know, you know, it is, um, uh, it is a uh, premise, you no, know, on uh, supporting the disengagement, rehabilitation, and reintegration, you no know, pathways through enhancing, you know, the, capa the national capacity, and then also to deliver like uh, the national program for disengaged combatants and then by directly you not know, providing no rehabilitation services you not know, for those who uh, defect and then go through the, the, the program. There are three centers you know, in uh, Somalia for the male. Uh, recently they have also opened uh, female centers you not know, for the female to address the needs of uh, the women. And then there are several rehabilitation uh, centers, no or integration centers, no for for for, for children. So just you know, say the, 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 the program you no know, functions you no know, through initially the presidential amnesty offer, which now has been turned you no know, into an amnesty policy. And um, it is a it is a hybrid. What makes you no know, say you no know, it very successful because you no know, say we couldn't, I mean. There was no way of doing no DDR you know, in, in such a context. And so you, you could call it you no know, like, you know, DDR. I think some people are calling it non-traditional DDR, third generation no DDR. But I think you know, it's like to really be very brief, 
is that uh, what you know has made the project the, the project you know so like, you know or the program you know, successful you know is it is a hybrid of uh, a tailored system that responds to the individual needs of whoever beneficiary you know is coming you know, to the center and that goes you no know, like you no know, from really doing the assessment of um, the the individual needs and then that is tailored you know, into a rehabilitation goal which is implemented over a period of uh, six to twelve not more than twelve months and uh, and that you knows like uh, we have no no seen you know, like you no know, successes you no know, in uh, the last you no know, five you no know, to seven years you no know, offering of course not like the usual services in any rehabilitation center education medical entertainment vocational education training and many times just like when people are going into their communities they are living there's something that which was new which was introduced like the placement and business uh, scheme like before they leave they get the skills from the center but before they leave they go through a placement scheme and by the time they are leaving they have a secure you know, like, you know of, of opportunity so that you no know, in itself you no know, has uh, been you know, like you know made the program you not know, very successful because it is tailored to the needs of the individual Thank you.